person in the house I just believe Christians ought to be happy they ought to act happy you know faith is an act sometimes I act happy when I may not feel so happy anybody do that or do we cave into feelings and act like our feelings that dictate to us David said I will be glad I will be that was his will I will be glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Anybody, anybody glad that you're in the house of the Lord this morning? Do I want you to give him some praise? Come on, I want you to put your hands together, open your mouth, shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Turn around and wave at somebody and say, good morning, church. <laughs> So good to see you. 
and it's good to see Brother John there, and he hadn't been able to come in months and months. Welcome, John. Good to see you. Praise God. And you can be seated a moment and just remain seated, and then in a moment I'll have you to stand right back up because we're going to receive an offering in a little bit, right? But I want to tell you about uh, camp meeting coming up, and we had to have a short version this year, but it'll be July the 11th. Rekindle the fire. And uh, the, the fire needs to be rekindled in the body of Christ. Come on. We don't need to let stuff get us down or impede us or slow us down. Praise God. We need to put it in drive and go all out for God like we've never been out for God. Can I get an amen? And that on July the 11th. So plan your vacation, all that around that. Pastor Dean Perry will be with us on Sunday morning at 10.15. And then that night, Prophet and Evangelist Donald Moore will be with us at 6 p.m. But we're going to have a great time. It's a short day, but we're going to pack a lot into it. We're going to have a great, great, wonderful time. And soon we're going to be able to move back uh, to our campus, uh, the Outreach Center, Old White Oak Road in a few weeks, and I'll let you know as soon as we can get that prepared and we can get back to some normalcy and we can probably in a, in a short while start some small groups and that kind of thing again. Just get back to normal. Amen? How many of you are ready to get back to normal? I'm ready for some normalcy. Amen? And uh, I believe we can do it and we'll do it. Well, we're going to use our faith to believe God that great things are ahead and in store for us. And if you are visiting with us, we are glad to have you this morning. Thank you for coming. I see Brother Donovan's got a friend, and I've met this gentleman, but I'll let him introduce him, maybe uh, uh, introduce him when he comes up. And uh, But anyway, it's good to see every one of you. I, I am glad when they said, let us go to the house of God. Church is a big deal with God. I said church is a big deal with God. Amen. I remember when I first got saved, you heard me say it before, but I fell in love with God. I mean, when I got born again, something happened. Something changed. My lifestyle changed too. When I got born again, I fell in love with God. I fell in love with his people. And I fell in love with the local church. The local church has been such an integral part of my life. It's all wrapped around God. But in the center of that are some other things. God's people and God's house and God's time that we come to worship. They have factored into my life. They have helped build my life and shape me. Praise God to what I am today. I am what I am by the grace and the mercy of God. Aren't you in love with Jesus this morning? I'll tell you, I believe when you fall in love with Jesus, you're going to fall in love with the things of God. Ushers, come on down. We're going to receive our tithes and offering, and you can stand with me again. And again, I want to thank you for your tithes and your offerings and your support of love. And those that are watching by Facebook or YouTube, we want you to know we appreciate you standing by us in prayer and with your love and support and financial support. So we're all working together. Praise God we can keep things going. We're not up begging this morning. We've taught people over the year to sow a seed. And a farmer knows that without a seed, there's no crop. And the Bible said that the seed is the word of God. And when we come and give to the work of God, we're sowing a seed into the kingdom of God. How many of you have been blessed through your giving through tithes and offerings? I know I've had some people say, well, I can't afford to give. I cannot afford not to give. I don't, I, look, I don't know how God does this, but you give God 10% and then give him offerings, whatever that may be, but at least 10%. And you, so that leaves you with 90. But God has taken my 90% and then my offerings, which would amount to more. But he's taken what I left, and I'm telling you, has stretched it farther than it would have went if I'd have kept the whole thing. Because had I kept it, I'd have been in disobedience to God. 
And the Bible said obedience is better than sacrifice. So when God sees our obedience, God says, I know how to stretch that. I know how to send you to the same grocery store, buy the same food everybody else does, but when you check out, it'll be less. I don't know how he does it, but he just does it, right? <laughs> God is a good God. But I do want to thank you for your tithe and offering. Praise the Lord. Is everybody excited about being in the house of the Lord today? Just wanted to say, <clears throat> I don't want to embarrass anybody, but as we're opening up, we see more and more people, and uh, it's so good to see Brother Tony today. Good to see Brother Tony. And so good to see Charles over here. It's good to see you. God bless y'all. And anybody else that I left out. But anyway, didn't mean to. But it's so good for, as more and more things are opening up. We just see people and love one another and gather together and praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, without any further uh, ado, we're just going to go right on with the service. And this morning, uh, the other day, I felt led and pressed to ask Brother Bill Donovan to uh, minister for us today. And uh, he's been a pastor and a minister for a long, long time. And he's full of the word of God, and he's always excited about it. So uh, would you give a warm hand to Brother Bill Donovan as he comes this morning? fun getting older. I'm just tickled to death. The bishop was show off. See him running down those steps. But he's got over 10 years on me. Just wait. Amen. 
Well, it'll sure be nice when everybody gets back in church. I feel like there isn't any excuse now. We ought to be back. There's nothing like being together with the saints of God. I think one of the best things about coming to church is all the sweet people and, and the hugs and the comments. Some of them are not as great as others. <laughs> that brother back there with the beard and the tape on his face, he was rubbing it in that, he, that how old I was. It's all right. He's going to get there. Now, like the bishop, I wanted to have a joke this morning. And I had picked out one. And I tried it on Amory, and there was complete silence. And she didn't laugh. And I had to explain it to her. So I said, well, I'm not going to do that. So no joke this morning. Praise God. Well... I love the Lord with all of my heart, and I trust that you do. You know, uh, this is a tremendous day, and I have never been any more excited than I am right now about what God is ready to do. And there's a lot of scriptures that I could use today, uh, favorite ones and maybe more exciting, but when Pastor Michael called, immediately there was a word came to my mind, harvest. I'm looking for a harvest, folks. I'm looking, this is no better time for a harvest than right now with all the things that have been going on and the fear in people's hearts and and not knowing what's going to happen next. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God loves you. And if we'll just fall in love with Jesus, one day we'll step out of this life and we'll march down those golden streets. And when we see the angels of God, we'll join our loved ones. We'll come face to face with our wonderful Savior, Jesus. We'll see mother and father and brother and sister and wife and husband and friends And I think of how it could have been. Could have been on the way to hell. Could have been. But you know, he has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I'm so glad to be a Christian. And I plan to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever is forever. Forever is forever. And you know what? I want all my loved ones. I have children, grandchildren, 21 great-grandchildren. Just had a little guy that's going to carry on the name. He's another William. We're calling him Will. Will but I want all of them to be with me in heaven one day. And I want all my friends and all those around me to be with me in glory. I'm getting up a crowd to go with me. And I hope that you will begin to trust the Lord for the salvation of your loved ones, of your friends, of your fellow workers, of your husband and your wife. I told that that pretty girl that's at the door when we come in, I can't think of your name, I'm so sorry. But you know, I, I'm old as dirt. So, But I told her to make a place beside her for her husband. And I think we need to, to be so concerned in this day for our loved ones. And so this is not going to be one of those emotional blessing kind of messages. But I am excited about what I see God doing in these last days, bringing forth a great harvest. So 
You, you know, I think of over the years in my ministry and, and I, I, the most enjoyable thing was to see people coming to the altar and weeping their way through to Jesus. Wonderful thought, wonderful thing. Back when I was a lot younger and used to horseback ride, I used to do that. <laughs> we had three tough men that were my friends. And they were into horses real big. We'd go to the sales and we'd ride. And they didn't know the Lord. They were living far from him. But after a while during our relationship, they began to come to church. And one morning when we had gathered at the altar and we were standing there, I looked out and one of those big old men were just crying and weeping. I thought, this is what it's all about. Getting people saved. Bringing in the harvest. That's what's going to fill this church as we see God in these last days bringing in the harvest. All right, let's get to what our, we have here. Matthew 18, 18. It says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then, let's see, Acts. My Bible's fallen apart, <laughs> but hey, it's in good company. Uh, Acts thirteen forty one. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And then Habakkuk 1, 5 says, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not leave, though it be told you. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, for a long time, it seems like we have been the silent majority. We've watched the rioters take over our nation and the structure of our society being torn in front of us. And too long we have been waiting. We have been holding the fort. We used to sing that song, shame on us. <laughs> Hold the fort, one of our hymns that we used to sing. But no longer must we sit idly waiting for the enemy to come to us. When we do this, we fight a stalemated battle. We don't gain any ground. All we do is hold our position, and God doesn't want us to hold our position. God wants us, hallelujah, to press the battle. Amen. We're in a battle against Satan, and he wants us to press that battle. And I ask you to say right now, Brother Donovan, I'll not be satisfied to just hold the fort and come Sunday after Sunday and get a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of emotion. Uh, and nothing wrong with that, but we want more than that. Our text says, Verily and I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's time to begin to understand who our enemy is that has been winning all the victories, taking our loved ones into the world, doing all kinds of things, taking the victory from us. It's time to understand this morning that we have the power to bind him, hallelujah, and the power to bind the power of sin and the power of disease and the power of negativism. It's time to loose, hallelujah, the spirit of salvation in Nashville 
Hill and in Nash County and all around this area. Let's loose the spirit of salvation in this place in the name of Jesus and loose the spirit of healing and miracles and signs and wonders and the spirit of faith upon our people in the name of Jesus. We have the most powerful force that you could think of, the name of Jesus and the authority of that name. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's bring the harvest in. Amen. Amen. We, we can still get to the baptistry. We can get people saved. here. We've got altars. We've got the baptistry. We need to get people saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. These are the last days and God said he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. I'm praying for our loved ones. I don't want any of my family not to arrive in heaven. I'll be watching for them and waiting for them. And I believe that we're going to reach them in these coming days. Let's bring the harvest in. The anointing is here. We have the anointing. God's spirit is loose here in this place. We are Pentecostal, and you could feel that as we were singing this morning. Amen. Didn't you like those praise choruses and the blessing of God? We're still Pentecostal, so let's praise him. Let's let have the anointing that is here. Bring in the unsaved. The anointing is here, and we need to use it to get people People saved. John 8 and 32 says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if you carry that truth out to your city and this whole area and say, Brother Donovan, I don't want things to continue as they are. You know, the devil is using this thing, this pandemic to keep people out of church. It's time we faced up that this thing is conquered and we're going to be back in church where we ought to be with the saints of God. And I, You know, you can watch it on your computer or TV, wherever you want to, but it's not the same as being in the house of God in the fellowship of the saints. Amen? amen. Come on, say amen. <laughs> uh, glory to God. Don't say I'm preaching at you, <laughs> but I am. So we need to carry the truth to our city and to this area. I want to step out and take up the battle. I'm in the autumn of life, but I still want to see God do something through my life. I want to be used of him. I want to again stand over somebody as they're weeping their way to Jesus and cry with them and pray with them and see them come through to the reality of the gospel. God wants to bring you into the realm of spiritual experience that, that you ne never dreamed, never even dreamed were possible. And I'm not talking about a blessing or just an emotional experience. Thank God for that. And I like that. But that's just not what I'm talking about. I'm speaking of beginning a warfare in the spirit. A warfare. I'm speaking of beginning a warfare in the spirit where you will, where you will see the enemy flee before you. I'm not as scared of the devil. He's as scared of me because I have the name of Jesus and the authority of Jesus Christ and I can come against him, the, the, he, he that is destroying lives uh, with all kinds of things that are enticing our youth and our young people. And I'm so glad that we're starting to do something with our youth. Uh, and, and we need to uh, put blinders on as far as some of the things that we see we old people, we don't understand that, but God can see through all of that and love those young people and love those people that are coming in, and we need them in here. We've lost some precious people since I've been coming to Fellowship Church. 
We lost the, that, that wonderful man that gave me the necktie. And he isn't wonderful because he gave me the necktie, but he greeted me at the door and entered and, and fellowshiped with me. And then the, the ladies, Joanne and the other lady and her husband and, 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 and brother, uh, brother Glenn, we so pray for him. And the enemy is trying to destroy his life, but he has been a fellowship uh, a present uh, influence in this place and we thank God for him and I'm glad that we can stand behind him and pray for him and think of all the things uh, that have happened in our church in the last few years. So uh, God's anointing and power which I speak of is not for God's servant alone or for just one here or there or for just Brother Michael or somebody. It, although he's been doing some tremendous preaching and teaching, has he not? I've been enjoying our brother. And, and there's one thing I know about him is the sincerity, the spirit of sincerity that I feel as our brother ministers. So he's humble, but God is using him. Plays the piano, sings, uh, visits, does all the things that a pastor does. Uh, he's a busy man. Pray for him. But it's not just Pastor Michael or Bishop or just certain ones, but it's what, what I'm talking about is for the whole body of Christ. You know, God can use you, your testimony alone, your life alone, pay your bills, live a life that is right, your, your speech, your all the things that you do. Because when you call yourself a Christian, people's going to be looking at you. And if you step out of, out, of, out of the realm of the Spirit, they're going to know it and they're going to criticize it. So this is a message today for the last day church before Jesus comes. I believe he's coming soon. I, I hope I can live long enough to be going up in the rapture wouldn't that be wonderful? But whether I live for, to see it or not, he's coming. He's going to take us up. We're not going to be in the tribulation, although sometimes I wonder if this isn't part of this tribulation. But it isn't because it's going to get a whole lot worse. But God's going to take us out of here before it happens. So what we want is a church that will be conquering the devil's territory. Amen. Amen. Devil thinks he's smart, thinks he's got people in control. He thinks he's destroying lives. But I have news for him. We're going to invade the devil's ter territory. We're going to see uh, God move in the midst of Nash County. And we're going to see wonderful things come to pass. Uh, and I'm not going to wait for it. I want to start right now, as we go out of this place uh, filled with the Spirit of God, God blessing us and filling us, and we're going to go out and love people. You know, we need to do everything in love. Amen. Everything we do ought to be in love. I love you. And you better love me. It might be a little hard, but go ahead and love me. Praise God. I love everybody. I love those that despitefully use me. And believe you me, I've been despitefully. You don't stay in the ministry for 58 years and not be criticized and all the rest of it. And don't say this is all for someone else. I'm just a nobody. God wants to use your life in a greater way than he has ever before. And I believe God will give you a new anointing. Hallelujah. To see answers and prayers. Answers that you really ne never, never had faith for. And I believe you'll see sickness of long standing loose from yourself and loose from your loved ones. Hey, I've been having an attack of the enemy the last few weeks. When brother called, I said, man, I've got all this going on, doctors and physical therapy and all that. 
And he said, well, you can do it next week. I said, next week I got the same stuff. So, you know, the enemy, the enemy will work on us. He'll do this. But we're conquerors. We're conquerors. That's why Brother John is back here. We're conquerors. We're going to conquer the enemy. We're going to destroy the enemy. Because I believe that we'll see rebellious children come home under the, under the, the desire of the Holy Spirit to be the kind of children that we parents long for. Sometimes we look at our children and we say, Lord, that's not what I envisioned. But we're going to see them come. We're going to see them begin to live for Jesus. I believe that you'll have financial answers for prayer. Talk about tithing. If you knew how small my income was and how the Lord blesses me, and I and I, I you know I do some things that maybe are stupid, but I enjoy it. And he's supplying the need. Amen. I started collecting guns. Can you remember? Can you believe it? At eighty-seven, collecting guns. <laughs> but I bought the most beautiful Henry the other day, all brass, eighteen shorts, and I bought a brother over here, brother Roland. Got me a gun case. $25. No wonder I like them. So, I still believe that whatsoever we bind, God will bind. Whatsoever we loose, God will loose. And in the Gospels, Jesus spoke of the harvest. That's what I'm talking about today, the harvest, speaking of the gathering of souls into the kingdom of God. You know, in our modern religious language, we have taken the word revival and we have used it interchangeably with harvest. And yet they are are two totally different things. Revival should never, never be used to describe harvest or should harvest be used to describe a revival. See, a revival takes place when God comes and he moves upon the heart of one of, of one who has grown cold or lukewarm or indifferent toward the things of God. And many of us are guilty of that. There are times when we we become uh, uh, cold and lukewarm. But thank God for revivals when we can come and we can get uh, another dose of God's spirit and blessing and we can be revived. Well, that's revival. This person that, that maybe once had an experience with God but drifted away from a spirit-led life. We have many people that have drifted away from the things of God that don't even darken the the door of a church. But we're going to see revival for that. But that's not what I'm talking about this morning. Then through the presence of the Holy Spirit, that spark, that spark in their life, which once burned and is kindled again, and that which was dead and that which was lying dormant is made to live again. Now, that's revival. And, I, and, I, and I'm glad to see that. We're going to see it because we got to be revived and spirit-filled so that we can get out there and be soldiers of the cross and bring in people to the sound of the gospel. You want to see me cry, just let me see some of my loved ones come and be brought into closeness to the Lord and saved. Oh, God help us. But the point that you must get, there had to be something to revive. What God is doing today far exceeds revival. For God is is moving in areas where there was no movement, where there was no sign of life before. (laughs) 
Amen. Amen. Take an old dry sinner and bring him in. Bring him in. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of drug addicts in America who have been healed by Jesus Christ even in the last years. Now, this is not revival. It's a harvest. Oh, praise God. I can see every empty seat filled. I can see the altar covered with tears as people come and acknowledge the need of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. There are people that don't believe in Jesus. Well, we're going to surprise them. We're going to show them Jesus and what he is and who he is and what he can do. See, all you have to do is speak about Jesus and something happens. You would be surprised if you'll begin to speak about Jesus, live for him, and act as a Christian out there in the world, then you will see something happen. I'm a positive person. Do you know that sometimes you have to look at the other side in order to understand the reality? We'll see some of the other side when people come in. I, I was in a church that I pastored some years ago, and we had uh, different families would take the cleaning different weeks. They I mean, clean for a month. And I had one couple come and say, we counted 60 cigarette butts on the front door of the church. And they were so upset about it. But some of those very people that left the cigarette butts were saved in a little while and they stopped smoking. I didn't preach about it. I didn't say they had to quit cigarettes. That's, that's their business. And if they want to smoke, that's their business. But I know a God that can change people's tastes and, 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 and do something great in their life. So there's always a positive and a negative. And if you think Smoking is bad. Wait till we start ministering and seeing the harvest come in and see what comes in here. See what will come in. It may shock you, but bless God, as we work with the youth in a simple thing as a baseball game or whatever they're doing, we'll see some people come in here and we'll, ah, but God's going to change them. God's going to change them. Hallelujah. Oh, bless God. It makes me happy and makes me want to weep before the Lord to think what he's going to do for our loved ones. You know, do you know why negative people never accomplish anything? because they're always looking at that one side. It's time for us to look a little further than that. That's how we're going to get the people in. And if we get the people in, then let the Holy Spirit get them. We want to get them. We can't get them. We can criticize and it'll do more harm and it'll keep them away from the church. I know more young people and more people out there as I used to visit around this area that will never darken a church because of criticism. Get them in here. Love them like they are and let the Holy Spirit begin to move in their lives. Oh, hallelujah. So if we get that right combination, see, the negative with the positive because light dispels darkness. Amen. Amen. Darkness and ignorance are the main enemies that hold back the power of God from flowing in our hearts. And friends, you know, I, I search the word and I say that to say this. In every harvest or every move of God that you have, the presence of unbelievers. But Habakkuk 1.5 says, I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe. I'm going to take hold of that. 
And I'm going to see him work a work at Fellowship Church. I will not believe. Hallelujah. If the church fills up down here, I'll crawl up the steps to the balcony. And I'll try to run down the steps like Bishop. Probably fall on my face. But I want you to know that as potential channels for the flowing of the Holy Spirit, it's not up to you and me to engage in a battle of words with the unbeliever. You can argue with them till you can argue with them to it forever if you want to. The unbeliever will always be present. There will always be the presence of unbelief. But the Bible says in Romans 3, 3, it says, for what if some do not believe? For what if some do not believe? And if God takes that attitude, why are we fretting so? Why are you staying up debating and sweating? Because there will always be the presence of unbelief in harvest or in revival. Now the world is made up of, of people with different natures. Huh? That's why Amory couldn't understand my joke. Because we Canadians have those dry jokes, you know. Well, I'm going to tell her a few jokes and explain them to her so she'll get practice. <laughs> First, we have the gullible person. He's the one who believes everything or anything you tell him. He's not wise because he gets in too many traps. And secondly, we have the skeptic. He's the person who doesn't believe anything. People say, if you only show me a miracle, <laughs> that's a joke. You show them a miracle and that, it just isn't true. Show them a miracle, they still won't believe. Because even after it happens, people will, you know, will uh, find some way to, to explain it or way because basically the, the main characteristic of their nature is skepticism. I wouldn't try to argue with some people, but I'll pray for them. I'll sick the Holy Ghost on them. Romans 3.3 3 says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? See, this is very important for you who are, who are dealing with hard cases. And there are some hard cases out there. It's only the Holy Spirit that can draw them. Our debates and arguments won't do it. But you see, our faith is not based on theory. Our faith is not based on doctrine. Our faith is not based on some theology. Our faith, in order to be secure, in order to stand the, the power of the enemy, and in order to resist the tide of unbelief must be based on that which is impregnable. Our faith must be based on that which is infallible, something that cannot be shaken. I'm standing on the rock, hallelujah, and God is keeping me firm in him, and it's only the Spirit of God that can do that, and, and, and something that will always overcome everything that comes against it. Amen. The basis for the impregnability of our faith 
in the Bible is God's word, which says heaven, it says in Matthew 24, 35, it says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass. See, God's word is important. It'll accomplish that which I please. It says in Isaiah 55, 11, it shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please. You know, looking back at Billy Graham's life, the turning point in Billy Graham's life was during a retreat in Southern California. It was just before he went into the Los Angeles crusade that brought him into national fame in America. He took the Bible. I read this in the book of his life. He took his Bible and he went into the woods during that retreat. And he laid it down and he said, God, I don't understand everything you've written there. I can't comprehend it. I can't comprehend it all. But he said, from this day forward, I'll never doubt it. If I don't understand it, I'll leave it alone. But he said, I'll never doubt it. He said, for me, when I leave these woods, the Bible will hold absolute authority. And see, this is what it boils down to. Does the Bible hold absolute authority in your life? If it does, you will stand the test of criticism. And I'll tell you, when you once start witnessing And going out and talking about Jesus, there will be criticism. I think the bishop knows a little bit about that. And I know a whole lot about it. But to not lay your life on the altar, to be used as a channel in God's hand, unless you're willing to get into the area of criticism. Don't lay your life on that altar to be used as a channel for God unless you're willing to be misunderstood. Your security, your steadfastness will be like the Apostle Paul's. He said, I know, I know whom I have believed. Hallelujah. I know whom I have believed. The, see, the word of God, the Bible holds absolute authority for me and I'm going to believe it. Amen. That's why we Christians need to stay in the word. And if we'll stay in the word, the word will get in us and it'll flow. I've been amazed at times when I go out to witness Scriptures come to my mind and, and, and that I hadn't thought of for a long time. But the Holy Spirit, as you study that word, will come forth when it's needed. Now, if you don't ever read the word, it's not going to come forth. But if you read the word and study and do your devotions, then you will have it come through your spirit when you need it. You know, God said through the lips of Habakkuk, he said, I will work a work. Hallelujah. So what we feel happening now in America is not the result of the work of any any person. I'm here to tell you it's the power of the Holy Spirit. If we accomplish anything at Fellowship Church, it's going to be the power of of the Holy Spirit. As we go out and witness and as we live for God before people, 
See, harvest is not the work of a man, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. We come to give our life not for that which passes away or withers, but we give our life for the work that God will do through us. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm just a channel. I I may not be very much, and certainly I may not be very good looking. My kids reminded me that my ears are getting bigger as I get older. And I said, God, I hope my nose doesn't. (laughs) So I may not be smart, but Lord, you're not depending. Come on. You're not depending on what I am. It's you, Lord. I'm just a channel. It's not the work of man, friends, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. God said, I will work a work. I believe he gave me that scripture. I may believe he gave me the word harvest because we need to hear it this morning and we need to act upon it and we stop sitting by and waiting for the enemy and holding the fort. We need to step forward and press the battle and see people saved and brought into this place. Otherwise, the church is going to die, folks. God said, I'll work a work. God said, I'll work a work. And he said, it'll be in your day. Hallelujah. Oh, to be ready when God is ready. And here is the negative that we need to tie with the positive to produce power. I believe one of the biggest failures of the church is that 99 out of 100 times It was not ready. I know. I've been there. They weren't ready when God was ready. They were fighting over an organ that was disposed of and bought a new one because they gave it. Isn't that right, Miss Faye? You know about that. And and one family was against the other and a big part of it was because of the old organ. And so we're so busy doing all those kinds of things. Questions about the church. What is this for? What is that for? Why are they doing this? And we're not ready. What God wanted to do passed by the church. And that's why God had to reach out and raise up other individuals. Because the church wasn't ready. God said it'll be in your day. That's my word to you this morning. It'll be in your day. This is God's hour of harvest. What a time for a harvest right now. Let's not wait. Let's get out there with the anointing of God and let the Spirit of God touch people's hearts as they see our testimony. This is God's hour of harvest. And I could go on, but I don't want to chase rabbits or beat a dead horse to death like some of us preachers do. Let's find out what God is doing and make our lives available to be a channel, to be a participator, not a spectator. Don't point at pastor and say, why doesn't he do that? Or why doesn't he do this? You do it. See what happens when, you, when it falls to you and you do it. I'm going to ask you to do something and I know this hasn't been an exciting message, but it's one that God has laid so deeply on my heart. I want to see people saved. I want to see us opening the baptistry and baptizing people and and see people saved and coming to the altar every Sunday morning. And this may not have been a Sunday morning message, but we don't have Sunday night anymore. 
So I had to preach Sunday night on Sunday morning. <laughs> See how us old people think? <laughs> Amen. Anyhow, God is moving in this day. And he's going to use what is here to be used. So let him use us. If you have loved ones that are unsaved, husband, wife, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, would you stand with me this morning right where you are? Praise God. Think of it. If the loved ones that we have stood for were here this morning, this bottom part of the church would be filled. Praise God. Can we sing, tis the season? <laughs> That's my course, but it sure fits this morning because I'm saying this is a season for a harvest. Let us just not sit around and enjoy ourselves, but let us get people in that will receive what we have. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Do you believe they're going to be saved, those people you're standing for? Do you believe it this morning? Oh, God. God, in the name of Jesus, we stand before you this morning on the behalf of those uh, that are outside of the ark of safety, that do not know you as their personal Savior. We believe, Lord, that your spirit will go before us and prepare the way, prepare their hearts, so that when we come, that they'll be open to what we have to say and open to our lives and see our lives. Let us not boast about being a Christian and then live like the world but let us be different let them see Jesus in our lives save them in the name of Jesus we release the spirit of salvation in this place and we look forward to the Sundays and the weeks ahead to see people coming in and falling at the altar and getting saved we believe it Lord do you believe it's the season do you believe this is the time for harvest? Hallelujah. Let's sing it together. Come on. Praise God. It's your season. Yes. To be blessed. God gave you a promise. You stood the test. The winners of heaven. I pour you out a blessing. Well, it's your season. I'll tell you, we'll be blessed, blessed when we see those people coming in and getting saved. Blessed and it's our season to be blessed, to I'm see our loved ones out. come, and to see those coming I'm into the church. Uh, I somehow, uh, God has just opened my eyes to see this place filled with seeking hearts, uh, running to the altar, coming for salvation, getting saved, building up the work of God. I see it. I see it. Amen. Come on, sing it. God gave you a promise. Oh, you stood the test. Yes. Where the wind is of heaven. Pour you out a blessing. Well, it's your season to be blessed. I've been through the fire. Yes. I've been through the flood. But I'm standing here. Because of his blood, he's going to open the windows and pour you out a blessing when it's your season. Sing it again and receive. To open your blessed. arms and your heart and receive what God it's has promised. Season, hallelujah. Harvest. To be blessed. A harvest. Hallelujah. God gave you a promise. Oh, stood the test. Yes, a promise. Hallelujah. Winds of heaven. It's your season. It's your season. It's your season. It's your season. Well, it's your season.
great message. Brother Donovan, it made me think of what the Lord said. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers. See, God is looking for laborers. I think for too long, maybe unconsciously we're not thinking that way, but we get at ease at what we're doing and we get comfortable. And we forget about there's a world out here, loved ones, family, lost, dying, going to hell. And you know, I would never be saved if somebody hadn't come to me and said, you need Jesus. And they told me why I needed Jesus. Not just to clean up my life, but that it would change me, my family. It would change my life, my everything forever. And I would get to live with him. And so I, I began to think about, I need Jesus. But it was because somebody told me about Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to prolong anything, but I just feel led to do this myself. We'll only take a moment. But if you, how many want to be used of God? Now, don't throw that word around lightly. You want to be used of God to win people, family to Jesus Christ. Let me see your hand. That means we're going to have to go in witness. We're going to have to pray and then we'll have to obey. Pray and obey. Dr. Paul Young Cho grew the, at one time, probably still is, the largest church in the world, over one million strong. They said, what is your secret of success? This is in South Korea. What is your secret of success? He said, I pray and I obey. So I'm going to ask us to gather around this altar here just for a moment and say, God, use me. And when God puts somebody on your heart or you just meet somebody, you do it in a nice way, you're not in their face, but you see an opportunity to tell them about Jesus and witness to them and invite them to church and bring them here. And I've often said if we get them here, it won't be long before they're going to get saved or they're going to move out. One or the other, they can't stand it. I mean, they either got to surrender or they got to turn away. But we're going to believe. So come on around here and just ask God. Say, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me in these last days. I want to be used of the Lord. And it's the anointing. Anointing fall on me. You can sing it. Anointing fall on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Anointing fall on me. Sing that with me again. Anointing fall on me. Anointing fall on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Anointing fall on me. You know, it doesn't take long to make a, a adjustment, a change right on the inside. In a moment's time, you can say, God, use me. Are you sincere about it? God, I want to be used. I want to win people to Jesus Christ. Take authority over the devil. Bind the works of the devil. Loose what is in heaven, and God will loose it here on earth. Amen. Father, I pray for this congregation, everyone that's come here this morning that said, use me. God, we're just vessels wanting to be used of you. We surrender. We surrender. Our life is not just about our conveniences. Our life is about being used for you, doing what you tell us to do, speaking to who we need to speak to, leading us to the right people to win them into the kingdom of God and we believe we're going to see a great harvest and we start right now at least we're going to make the attempt to bring somebody to church next week at least we're going to tell somebody would you come with me we can't make them come that's where the Holy Spirit has to move on their heart and bring them but we're going to invite them 
that they can come to a place just as they are, knowing that they will be loved and not criticized. And we'll let you do the work in their lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, you believe that? Then give, Lord, give the Lord some praise. Come on. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Tell somebody as you'll leave and say, I believe God's going to use you mightily in these last days. Say that. I believe God is going to use you mightily in these last days. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I believe God is going to use you mightily in these last Thank days. God Glory to God.